Welcome to Making Money. This is Matt McCall. Thanks for joining me. It's May 2nd, 2023. We got a big show because we got a big week coming up. We get the Fed meeting tomorrow. What are they going to do? Well, we're thinking 25 basis points. We'll dive into that, how that's going to affect your portfolio, which asset classes are going to start moving based on that. We have the jobs report at the end of the week. We have more earnings, one of the busiest weeks for earnings. We have Apple, largest company in the world, coming out with earnings on Thursday. All this and more as the market attempts to break out. Coming up right now on Making Money. Most investors never touch this segment of the market, but according to the latest analysis from our team at Stansbury Research, this is the number one most important sector to pay attention to in 2023. And we're urging you to move your money immediately. You can stay one step ahead of the market, potentially unlock extraordinary gains just by understanding why this sector is set to boom. I strongly encourage you to read our analysis totally free today. It's all spelled out in a free report we just put together. Get the facts yourself. Go to hiddensector2023.com to get your free copy of this report. You can learn how to profit from the untapped potential in this hidden sector before it becomes widely known. Again, that's hiddensector2023.com for a free copy of our new report. Again, thanks for joining me. This is Matt McCall. It is May 2nd, 2023. It is a Tuesday here in South Florida. As I mentioned, uh, we have a big show because we have one hell of a week coming up. Uh, We have the Fed meeting tomorrow. Uh, Actually, the meeting started today, but the decision will come out midday tomorrow. We're going to talk about the Fed in a minute, so I'm not not going to glaze over that. We're going to dive into that a little bit deeper here in a minute. We have the jobs report coming out on Friday, which obviously the Fed looks at because they continue to raise rates uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, But one of them tends to be because the jobs market remains hot. So we'll see. Uh, the expectations are for job growth to slow a little bit. Uh, also, the expectations are for the uh, unemployment rate to tick up a little bit. That is obviously not something you want to see. Less people are getting jobs, more people unemployed. That being said, I think we're fully uh, employed right now based off the numbers. And even if it ticks up a little bit, unemployment rate, we're still fully employed. And if we do see that happen, move in that direction, maybe the Fed will finally get their head out of the sand and stop raising interest rates because they're heading for a very hard landing if you do not pause after this meeting. We had another failure in the bank system. Uh, First Republic, symbol FRC, was rescued, if you want to call it that, this weekend uh, by the FDIC and was then obviously, as you've seen in the headlines, sold to J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, symbol JPM. And uh, this was a was a big deal. And I don't want to dive too much into it right here in today's show. I uh, kind of really delved into it uh, yesterday's um, Daily Insights, which we write a free email that comes out every day the stock market's open. Uh, I detailed that yesterday, my view on it. I also detailed the earnings season so far, how it's actually been much stronger than the media will actually let you believe. Uh, much, much stronger, as a matter of fact. Uh, they're coming in... Uh, uh, raising, uh, they're coming in beating, and they're coming in and taking the negative 6.7 they're expecting uh, for negative earnings growth for the first quarter. Now it's down about 3.5, 3.6. Still negative in the second quarter in a row. However, m- numbers have been coming in much better than expected. But again, back to this uh, bank failure. And let me show you, I can show you a chart here of, of really what happened with First Republic. I mean, you can look at a chart and kind of get an idea. Look at this chart here at First Republic, folks. I mean, this stock was up at $220 a share and change in November of 2021, halted at $3.51, where it closed on Friday. Uh, basically, shareholders were likely getting nothing out of this. Uh, but just back in early March, uh, this stock was a $125 stock. And as you can see in that March time frame, it just they pulled a rug out from underneath it. Then it went sideways for a little through March and April, and then just about a week and a half ago, the rumor started again that, uh-oh, there's going to be a bit of trouble here coming with First Republic. Now, let me flip over to J.P. Morgan Chase, a little bit big, a little bit different um, chart here. And you can see on the right-hand side, it actually gapped up yesterday in the news uh, because if you look at any of the news that came out, J.P. Morgan got one hell of a deal. Stock is down today about nine-tenths of percent, but uh, overall, uh, you can see J.P. Morgan 
<clears throat> holding up much better uh, than First Republic, obviously, and much better than the overall uh, regional banks have held up in the last couple of months. Um, again, not to put too much into this topic because I wrote all about it yesterday, broke down the numbers. But I will say there is a clear winner here. And uh, maybe let's say two winners. Uh, the, the, the clear winner was JP Morgan. Um, they put in a bunch of assets in the, in the deposits and they're getting their deposits back basically, plus others deposits. And they're basically saying it's going to be accretive immediately to the bottom line, to the tunes of hundreds of millions of dollars, $500 million to the bottom line annually. But they said, no, 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 but it may take us, you know, a billion dollars or two for restructuring the next couple of years. Man, they got a deal. All I'm saying is I believe they got a hell of a deal. And I believe the FDIC and everything that's going on just proves how crooked the banking system is, how crooked the government is, and how important it is to network folks. So if you're young and you're watching this or listening to this, network. I'm not saying you end up like JP Morgan. I hope you do. But get out there and network because it's, it's about who you know. I don't care what anybody tells you. It's about who you know. I wish I would have been better as, as, as a child and as a, a young adult. I was not very good at it. I mean, I went out a lot, but I wasn't very good networking with the right people. Um, it eventually turned out okay, but I will say, J.P. Morgan is in bed with a lot of people that have a lot of power, and that's how they came out looking so good. The other winner here potentially uh, is going to be anybody who's got deposits at these large banks. Um, they're not letting you know regional banks like First Republic go under. They're definitely never going to let the large banks go under. So that's where you want to have your deposits. That, that's pretty clear and simple. The government will not let anything happen to them. And if anything, make them stronger along the way by buying the failing regionals for pennies on the dollar. All right. So enough about the banking crisis here and what's going on. But again, I don't know if this story's over. I don't know any banks in the back of my mind here that I hear the whispers on the street that could be the next uh, to fail. As, as you probably know, this is the third major bank failure so far this year. Um, nothing yet. If I hear any rumors, I will let you know, but nothing as of yet is the next bank that could potentially fail. But if it does, who the hell cares? The market rallied right through it anyway. Does it really, does it really even matter? Unless you own that bank, probably not. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about the Fed. And then I want to talk about bear markets because the calls for major bear markets and for major recessions are getting louder and louder. But first, we need to talk about the Fed because obviously tomorrow that is going to rule the markets. And let me show you a chart here first of uh, what has gone on here with the Fed. Um, and you can see here, this is a Fed rate hiking cycles going back uh, to 1972. And in orange there is uh, 2022-2023. We've already raised uh, over um, uh, 4.5% uh, on the Fed funds rate. So you can see how quick that is. The only time it's been it's been faster than that was in 1980. And we know 1980 was really hyperinflation, let's call it. I mean, that was massive inflation back then. And that's what the Fed did uh, to fight inflation back then. We ended up having another bout of inflation after that. <clears throat> but keep in mind, in 1982, we began the greatest bull market in the history of the U.S. stock market. From 88, or sorry, from 82 to 2000. 18-year bull market. I mean, that was just an amazing time to be in the market. You could have bought, thrown anything at the wall and probably made money back in 82. Unfortunately, I was six years old and probably throwing Play-Doh at the wall, so that didn't help me too much. And my family didn't know what the stock market was, so that didn't help us either. So we didn't really have the insight to that. But I'm telling you right now, I believe we're still in the midst of, of a great bull market. I believe that the uh, next 10 plus years where innovation is going to change the world, AI probably leading that. We'll talk about AI here in a minute. But I wanted to show you that because we have had very, very fast um, rate hikes, the second fastest we've seen in literally five decades, folks. So for tomorrow, 25 basis points is locked in. That's 0.25%. That will take the Fed funds rate to a range between five and five and a quarter percent. Um, the big question is not that. It's about a 98% chance that happens. The big question is at the next meeting on June 14th, and then the meeting after that, July 26th. At the next meeting on June 14th, what will the Fed do? So any type of indication that Fed Chairman Jerome Powell gives tomorrow, that is what is going to drive the market. 
not a 25 basis point hike. They're not going to do zero. They're not going to do 50. It's just not happening. And if it does, I buy you all a drink. It's not happening. And so that's not going to be the market mover. It's going to be what they say, what Fed Powell has to say. When he answers questions, how is he going to answer them? What is he going to remain hawkish or are they going to become a little more dovish and maybe take their foot off the pedal? I don't know. This Fed is not easy to figure out. I don't know. With a third bank going down, with the market, you know, kind of just going sideways recently, uh, with the, the, the bearish undertones of the market and the economy getting stronger, which again, we're talking about bears in a minute, I, I, I think they have to pause. Or I think they will pause, I should say. I think they should, I think they should pause now. I don't think they should raise tomorrow. Um, but we'll see. I think they're gonna, they will raise tomorrow. And after that, I'm leaning towards a pause in June, but anything could happen. And again, uh, not only do we not know if they're going to raise one more time in June, the market is still pricing in a 90% chance that the Fed funds rate will be below that range of five to five and a quarter. So by tomorrow night, it's going to be five, five and a quarter. So we're pricing in after the December meeting of this year, it's going to be below that. So basically what they're saying, the market, a 90% chance, according to the market, that the Fed will cut rates by the end of the year. I don't know if they will. Again, I believe they should at some point later this year, as long as everything goes that how I think it's going to go plan, which it never does. So I can't really put my two cents in until I see how the market reacts and how inflation numbers look, um, how the economy looks, uh, how earnings look, uh, how the banking system looks. There's a lot of things, geopolitical situations. So I, I can't say that. But I still think the odds are probably 50-50 that they do lower rates by the end of 2023. The dilemma that comes on upon the Fed right now is if they raise more and become what is called hawkish, hawkish, more aggressive, that there is a higher chance of what we call a hard landing. And that would mean a solid to deep recession. On the other side, if they stop right now, which they're not going to, but I say they stop after tomorrow's meeting, they risk inflation coming back. And that's one thing they don't want to see. Again, we saw that back in the early 80s. And that's one thing that if they let that happen, every critic in the world is going to say, what the hell is wrong with you? You knew the 80s. How can you let this happen again 40 plus years later? I, I Again, it's it's. I don't envy the Fed. And, and I'm, I'm not saying I would like to be Fed Chairman Powell right now. That being said, they made their own bed over the last couple of years. So they made the bed and they have to lie in it now. So they need to figure this shit out. And again, I think they do 25 tomorrow. And I think the likelihood is they pause after that. Uh, what I would like to see done, pause immediately and then wait and see how things are in the second half of the year. That won't happen, though. We know they're going 25 uh, when they come out tomorrow. So let's take a look at where we are right now. Stocks, gold and interest rates give you an idea. So here we are with the S&P 500. It's having an ugly day today. Uh, we're only an hour in a trading. We're down over 1% already. Uh, going into the Fed meeting, people are a bit concerned. All that being said, there's a few things I want to show you here in a chart. We rallied up yesterday to the best level that we've seen uh, in about two and a half months, nearly three months. That's good, even though we're down 1% today. And we came close to breaking about on the SPYs, which is the spiders, uh, the 420 level. I said it's about a week and a half ago. If we break above that 420 level, that's a very major breakout for me. And we run from there. We look at the, the, the NASDAQ 100, which is obviously tech heavy and more specifically, large tech heavy, meaning Apple, Microsoft, Google, et cetera. That hit an intraday high yesterday, the best level since mid-August of last year. Uh, we closed down yesterday. We're down today. So it's a bit of a reversal pattern. We're about 320 on the triple Qs. We can come down 310. And still look great. And that may happen if we have a pullback after the Fed tomorrow. But again, a little bit of a mini breakout for that it hasn't hold, held yet. Uh, but we've had some good, um, good patterns happening in the last uh, four or five months in both the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ uh, 100. Let's take a look at gold here, folks. I know a lot of you like gold. Um, we're trading about 186 on GLD, which tracks the price of gold. We're just under $2,000 an ounce uh, on gold, which is kind of a psychological and a bit of an important resistance level. 
I don't know where we go from here. We've had guests call for 3,000. We get we can hover around at 2,000. That wouldn't surprise me. It all depends on me, on, on the Fed and the dollar, what happens. If we see uh, the dollar start really coming down, I think gold must take off in the near term. But again, I, I'm, not, I'm not overly positive on it. It's more of a coin toss from here. And lastly, we'll take a look at the yield on the 10-year. And as you can see here on the 10-year yield, uh, we've really been going sideways. And at this point, really no clear indication of what the Fed's going to do tomorrow uh, based off what the chart says. And we can say that for almost all the charts I just showed you. Um, gold kind of going sideways, the market consolidating near a breakout level. So a bit of hesitation. But again, maybe some of that is a fact that we're just digesting what happened yesterday uh, over the last couple of days. Uh, with a third major bank failure this year. Could be a lot of things. You know, day to day, people always, I, I, the headlines that you see, and this is going to get me into the financial media here right now, is um, there's always a reason why the market's up or down that day. Folks, it's not true. Things just go up and down for whatever reason. When you wake up and, or you lay in bed at night and you say, you know, I had a hell of a good day. Is there always a reason for it? No, you said a good day. Or I'm like, man, today I just felt off. Is there a reason for it? No, just sometimes you feel off. You're a ball of energy. It's not always great. And uh, same thing in the stock market. That energy is a, is a culmination of all of our energy coming together. It's, it's human psychology being put out on graphs and paper and prices and tickers and everything else. So at the end of the day, some days it just doesn't. There's no explanation. So why we're down today, if I had to guess, Maybe because we're a bit skittish because of the bank failures, and maybe because we're go we have the Fed tomorrow, we don't know what the hell they're going to say. So that's one thing that irritates me. The financial media, as you know, I was a member of the financial media for ten plus years, and uh, a paid member of the media. You go to these people's uh, LinkedIn pages and Twitter and everything. And it's like Fox Business and CNBC and Fox News. No, you appeared on there once. You were not in, an employee. News Corp sent me a paycheck. And what's funny is back then, obviously, I had, I had my companies. I always made, me, made them send me a paper check, and I keep stack them up, and I'd cash them like two months at a time. I always thought that was neat because I never had checks anymore. And that was kind of my fun money that they, that they paid me for that. Still believe to this day I was one of the lowest paid men ever to have a, a co-host of a national television show, which is not something to brag about, but it's a God honest truth. Something else that tends to irritate me is perma bears. And, folks, a perma bear is a person who – is just always negative on the market, regardless of the fact of the market going up about almost 80% of the time, I think 78% of the time the market goes up. So you get really, really horrible odds, but you're just a perma bear. Most perma bears that I've met in life fall into one or two categories. One, they're snake oil salesmen, meaning that they're preying off fear you may not believe the stuff they're spewing, but they're preying off it. And they sell a lot of books, they get a lot of speaking gigs, and all that kind of stuff. The other half truly are just miserable human beings. And they want everybody else around them to be miserable. So I'll tell you, when I'm on a panel with a perma bear, there's no upside. The perma bear guy who's just negative, I try to get put some sunshine and shine some light into his soul. It never works. The snake oil salesman, I just like to bash them on stage and embarrass them in front of people because they're really not doing anything uh, to help investors. If anything, they're hurting them. Well, nothing against the gentleman I'm about to speak about now, but I, I noticed over the last couple of weeks, there's been a barrage of perma bears, negative remarks coming from the old guys that you hear all the time and coming from big firms as well. So I want to start with... Um, really kind of where the market's at right now and maybe what's feeding their thought process. So let's take a look here real quick at a couple of charts because I think it's a lot of times uh, the best way to get this uh, across to you. And as we can see here in this chart, uh, this is showing uh, the, uh, the futures positions and it shows a, 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 an underweighting here. And uh, what this shows is uh, that the speculators, hedge funds have increased their short bets on the S&P 500 last week to a level now that is the lowest since 2011, meaning that there's more shorts out there than longs since 2011, towards the end of 2011. So, of course, the first thing I did, folks, was I went to my handy little chart here in the S&P 500. I said, well, what was the market doing in late 2011? 
And you can see right there, you know what the market did? It hit a one-year low, bottomed, and then started a rally that did not see a bear market until the end of 2018. And that almost scurried it because I think it was down about 19%. So really, it started a bull market run that lasted until the pandemic. So nine years long. A nine-year-long bear market, the last time that happened. I'm not calling for that exactly right now. But again, when we get to situations like this, typically we're at, 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 at levels in a stock market where we turn the opposite way and turn bullish. Bank of America Global Fund Manager Survey, 286 participants in this, and they manage $728 billion, nearly a quarter trillion dollars from these 286 participants in this survey. As of right now, there's a 63, 63% of them believe that the economy is going to be weak through next year. Just last month, that was 50%. And let me show you the chart here, as you can see, at this level here. Um, it, it just, they believe it's going to continue to deteriorate. It's just getting worse and worse. And you can see here, um, at, at, at levels like this, you start getting to times where the market bounces and you can kind of, it's, it's a very ugly chart to look at, but they typically coincide with market bounces. Then we have a study within it shows that there's an 80, 86% of the participants believe we'll have stagflation through early 2024. We don't want that. Stagflation is a combination of two things. You probably have heard it more recently. It's a combination of higher inflation and a slowing economy. That's where it's stag from, from stagflation, of inflation, stagflation. Weak economy, inflation moving higher. We don't want to see that. Another chart I want to show you here is the weighting in stocks is at the lowest level since 2008. Look at this, folks. Since 2008, you go all the way back, bottom at what? March 2009. Do we know what happened in March 2009? Again, one of the greatest buying opportunities of our generation. You break this down even further, we see that bond allocations are now 10% overweight in April. In March, they're only 1%. The highest level we've seen in over allocation towards bonds, again, since March 2009, the bottom of the financial crisis. One more chart here I want to show you. This is money markets. This was as of a few weeks ago, but hitting $5.25 trillion, the most ever in money market funds. Look at that spike. This is just going back from the beginning of 2021. This isn't looking at a long term. Look at that spike. Why? Well, two reasons. One, they're going to pay a little bit higher interest rate than your bank is uh, offering you as they steal your deposits, basically. Um, the other reason is people are looking for safety. All right. So I, what I did is I set this up for the bears. I gave the bears a shot. However, even though a lot of this stuff is, is, is negative, we take a contrarian view, which means we actually should be positive on stocks. I've had this contrarian view since October and stocks have been going up. I don't believe it ends. Do we go straight up? No, we haven't gone straight up since then. We're going to have pullbacks. We're going to have, um, you know, five to 10% pullbacks. I'm okay with that. That's part of the market. And it's going to be volatile between now and the end of the year. But I still think the path of least resistance right now for equities is higher. So number one bear I want to call out. I never met this gentleman. And maybe we'll get him on the show, let him uh, talk up his side of the story. It's John Husband. He's the president of Husband Investment Trust. He makes some wild calls, folks, over the years. Claims to have called the 2000, 2008 crash. That being said, what he's done over the years really has been bearish all the time. So even a broken clock is correct twice a day. These guys aren't even correct that often. So I, I'm going to show you how well his mutual fund's done and, and let you, see that, you know, look at it then. But this is, this is something he said. He said, at present, our most reliable equity market valuation measures remain more extreme than any point in history prior to July 2020, COVID with the exception of a few months directly surrounding the 1929 peak in two weeks of April 1930. The Great Depression and an unprecedented government-induced shutdown of the global economy. He's comparing that to right now. That's what his numbers are saying. Similar situations. 
came out and said it's likely to have negative 10 to 12 years for the S&P 500 for total returns and believes that interim losses will be in the, in the uh, ballpark of 60% from here, a 60% pullback from here. Well, I will. So I did some work and look back and, and, you know, you always have to look at what these bears have said in the past. 2014, second half of 2014, we just showed you 2014 was in the middle of a great bull market. He issued regular warnings about a crash, uh, even going as far as to say that stocks were going to crash in October 2014. Um, since then, obviously, the market has uh, been on an absolute tear. You may take a look at where we were in 2014. Around, we've, we've more than doubled since then. So you would have missed out on doubling your money if you're listening. Plus, you would have been short and probably went broke. January 2018 said the S&P 500 is ready to lose 67% of its value. Uh, that would take the, the index from 2,800 at that point down to 950. Well, after COVID, everything else, we're sitting around 4,124 right now. November 2017, right before that, said investors are, billing, investors are willfully ignorant. And again, called for 63% drop in 12 years of negative returns for the S&P. So... The reason I bring this out is because this headline of, of Hussman coming out in the last week, talking about, again, another 60% pullback in equities, makes its rounds, gets on TV, Business Insider covers it. It's just everywhere. And real investors like yourself, that this isn't your full-time job. You don't know the history of the market. You don't know the history of this gentleman. Take this for what it's worth and get spooked out of the market or it keeps you out of buying stocks because of this. But again, this could happen. I, I don't have a crystal ball, but the likelihood, because he's been wrong for decades, is not good. And I just showed you reasons why of the charts prior to that. We had Jeremy Grantham, who's been a uh, perma bear for years, GMO founder, um, co come out recently and said that the uh, SB could fall another 50%. Morgan Stanley's Mike Wilson, who could be one of the biggest clowns on Wall Street, um, said there's a collapse in earnings coming this year that would drive the S&P down to a range between 3,000 and 3,300 uh, before recovering back to 3,900 before the end of the year. Boy, I tell you what, that is pretty damn precise. If that's a real crystal ball, I would love to see it. Um, and then, you know, th that's about a 30% downside from here down to 3,000 3, the S&P 500. It's a big ass pullback for earnings recession. We're in the earnings recession. We had negative last quarter. We have negative this quarter and most likely the next quarter after that. We know this. How is that going to put us in earnings recession? We know this. We're here. You don't look backwards. You look forward. Some of the rationale sometimes just blows my mind. Piper Sandler's uh, Michael uh, Kantrowitz came out, says he sees a recession ahead. Certain areas of market begin to price this in. Sees the S&P 500 finishing around 3150 at a 25% pullback from here. Big pullback. Bank of America strategist uh, Michael Hartnett and uh, Savitna Subramanian. Sub said that in client notes that stocks are due for a rough ride ahead of mid-recession, S&P could, could fall to 3000 It sounds like all these ladies and gentlemen got together at some fancy place and uh, said, you know what, what number are we going to come up with for bears? 3000 Ah, sounds good to me. Let's go. Let's say a happy hour. Just this arbitrary round number. And again, folks, I, I wanted to point this out because if you follow these bears, you will not do well. I'm going to show you the chart right now of the Hussman Strategic Growth ET, uh, Fund, mutual fund, symbol HSGFX. This is a fund that's about $500 million in assets under management, so not that big. Uh, they invest in stocks as well as uh, short futures and short-term treasuries. Now, look at this chart, folks. This is a 10-year return. In this time, last 10 years, the QQQ is a NASDAQ 100 ETF is up 400%. The S&P is up 213%. The HSGFX, the Husband Strategic Growth Fund, is down 30%. Just imagine, that's real freaking money. You would have got absolutely crushed with your money. So why would you take advice from somebody like that? It just doesn't make sense. Um, you know, we all have bad years. My innovation stocks had a bad year last year. I, I've admitted that many, many times. But look at my 20-year track record, one of the best in the industry. That's what you have to look at. This is 10 years, folks. He had the COVID in there. He had the recent pullback. He had things he could have done well with. Just hasn't. So, again, I'm not picking on him specifically, even though it sounds like I am. I'm picking on the bears in general, the perma bears. 
cannot let them cloud your investment decisions. You want to invest in solid, long-term companies that you believe in, that are in massive mega trends, good business model, good management, good chart, good fundamentals for the long term. All right, folks, I hope it helps, helps you a bit kind of get that cloudiness of the bears out of your head. But thank you so much for watching. Uh, we have a great interview coming up later this week with somebody that actually tends to be bearish. Let's see what kind of debate we have. Jim Rickard's coming up on Thursday. You won't miss that. But again, thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful Tuesday, Wednesday. Here's hoping the Fed does the right thing. Thanks so much for watching. That was Making Money, and I'm Matt McCall. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.